This is the Dollamore Daily, and I'm Jesse Dollamore. It happened again, the way it always does. Another gun owner kills a room full of people for no reason at all. I could tell you the victims were loving wives, devoted husbands, sons and daughters gone too soon. I could tell you the person responsible planned to keep killing if they hadn't been stopped. Stopped meaning killed or taken into custody. I could even say no one saw it coming. But can anyone believe that nonsense at this point? If you're wondering which incidents of mass murder I'm referring to, but are frustrated at the lack of specifics I'm giving you, allow me to make my point even clearer. The specifics don't matter. Did eight people die or was it 20? Was it a hate crime? Was the gunman a religious zealot? Did they blame violent video games or God help me their sexual frustration? Who really gives a shit about a twisted killer's motive? What should be the focus right now is how to stop this from happening. Not doing so diminishes the memory of every single one of the dead and shamefully repudiates the tragedy and pain felt by everyone who has to pick up the pieces when their loved ones are brutally ripped away. Gun violence is the deadly crisis in this country that we're continuously shocked by, despite how commonplace it is. No matter how many times someone chimes in with, did you hear about what happened in such and such? It never really seems to sink in with us. Ironically, the best article on gun violence in this country might be from this one, from The Onion, who really nailed it with this headline. No way to prevent this says only nation where this regularly happens. Adding to the gallows humor inherent in this joke about our indefensible complacency is that The Onion runs that exact same headline every time a mass shooting happens. Here's the thing. Mass shootings aren't inevitable. There's a way to preserve individual freedom and allow for responsible gun ownership without having to accept all of this senseless death at the hands of murderers. A right to own lethal firearms does not outweigh a fellow citizen's right to not be gunned down in cold blood. At their grocery stores, movie theaters, and I can't believe I have to say this, their elementary schools. From speed limits to cigarette warning labels, everything that poses a public health risk should have safety measures in place to protect people. Until politicians realize that meaningful action has to be taken on gun control, there will be more Atlantas, more Boulders, and Orange County, Californias, and many, many more. Look, since countless images of in inconsolable survivors aren't enough to convince some that something's wrong, and since facts don't care about their feelings, let's try some of those. Some facts, some statistics, some numbers. The first number is 32. As NPR reports, the United States had the 32nd highest rate of deaths from gun violence in the world in 2019. If you're tempted to argue that that's not so high up the rankings, know this. A lot of poorer nations, considered by dipshits like Donald Trump to be so-called shithole countries, were a lot better than us at keeping their people from shooting each other to death. The next number is 10,000. The Gun Violence Archive found that in the first three months of 2021, the year we just started, there were over 10,000 gun violence deaths in the United States. And the annual count has hovered between 40,000 and 60,000 deaths over the past few years. Certainly there are decent and ethical and knowledgeable nonviolent people in this country who own guns. I'm not arguing that they don't exist. After all, WAMU reports that there are 393 million guns out there in America. More guns than people. Hell, that's, that's more guns than cars. And this is America. We love our cars. With 40% of Americans having a gun in their household, there must be more than one or two responsible gun owners around. But there were over 
1,800 unintentional shootings in 2019, meaning there are people literally shooting themselves in the foot. Talk about making yourself a metaphor. The next number I want to share with you is 16. The FBI found that the average number of active shooter incidents a year in America had risen to over 16 in 2013 and it kept climbing. In 2017 alone, there were over 30 of them. August 3rd, 2019, El Paso, Texas. August 4th, 2019, Dayton, Ohio. August 31st, 2019, Odessa, Texas. December 10th, 2019, Jersey City, New Jersey. If these dates are fuzzy in your mind, even though they weren't that long ago, it's because some shootings are happening one day after the next. And that brings me to my final number, 1,500. The BBC says it costs around $1,500 to buy the kind of assault rifle that that worthless piece of shit used to slaughter 60 innocent concert goers and injure 411 more in Las Vegas while perched in a smashed out hotel window. That's pretty much the same price tag as the laptop used to produce this high quality video presentation. Now take a second to remember that all of those numbers represent lives that were lost. Well, all except the cost of the weapon. But we'll get to that in a second. Gun violence isn't just an American problem. But unlike the US, other countries didn't sit back and endure over 100 mass shooting incidents before passing meaningful legislation to prevent further violence. Famously, in response to a deadly mass shooting in 1996, Australia passed sweeping gun control laws. The National Firearms Agreement established a national gun registry required permits for all firearm purchases, and banned all automatic and semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. To correct the fact that the many now illegal guns were in circulation, the Australian government did something that Americans may find hard to believe. They sponsored a national gun buyback. Some 650,000 guns were peacefully given up as a result of this program. An estimated 20% of all privately owned guns in the country and this all led to an entirely predictable outcome. Less death and less destruction. Studies like the Australian gun buyback from Harvard Injury Control Research Center showed a 57% reduction in firearm suicides in the seven years following the NFA, and a 42% decline in the average firearm homicide rate. And the areas where more people participated in the buyback saw proportionally higher reductions in gun deaths. And the two years after the NFA was passed saw the greatest decrease in the homicide rate out of any two year period in Australian history. And this wasn't easy to achieve. John Howard, the prime minister at the time, acknowledged that taking on gun reform may be unpopular and potentially dangerous for him personally. He even wore a bulletproof vest when addressing a guns rights support club and had to rally leaders across the nation to get the NFA passed. But he did get it done. In the end, his efforts saved lives, likely by reducing homicides and even more starkly, the number of suicides in the country. After the 2019 Christchurch mosque shootings, New Zealand's government wasted no time banning nearly all types of military style semi-automatics and assault rifles and created a buyback program similar to Australia's. Following a mass shooting last year in Nova Scotia, Canada announced a ban on assault style firearms. Germany, has quite a few guns per capita, but relatively low gun violence. I wonder why that is. Well, it probably has something to do with their tough psychiatric monitoring and litigious approach to gun ownership. And Japan has almost no guns, thanks to a law prohibiting the ownership of swords and firearms that would make gun enthusiasts from other countries' heads explode. One upshot, though, they enjoy an extremely low rate of gun death. Right now, there's a push to pass new gun laws. Organizations like Everytown and March for Our Lives support the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. The NICS requires state law enforcement and gun dealers to inform law enforcement when someone fails a background check. These laws prevent thousands of prohibited gun owners from obtaining weapons every single year. 
Gun reform activists also support background checks for all gun sales. Federal law requires background checks every time a person attempts to buy a gun from a licensed gun dealer. But this doesn't apply to unlicensed gun sellers who operate online and at gun shows. This enormous loophole absolutely lets prohibited gun owners acquire guns, no questions asked. This has to end, and we need to take mandatory background checks for all gun sales nationwide. Despite what some people might claim, requiring background checks on all gun sales isn't a big strain on gun sellers. It simply requires them to meet buyers at a gun dealership where they can run a background check. Gun stores are plentiful. Listen to this. 99% of Americans live 10 miles or closer to a gun dealership. So if you really want a gun, finding a store that'll sell you one is about as easy as driving to a strip mall with a cell phone and a vape shop on the premises. Uh, another good idea for curbing gun violence is waiting periods. If someone is contemplating an act of violence on themselves or on others, waiting periods slow down their ability to get a gun, thus diffusing potentially deadly situations. A study called Handgun Waiting Periods Reduce Gun Deaths concluded that waiting periods resulted in a 17% reduction in gun homicides. Currently, only five states and DC have waiting periods for all firearm purchases. Five more states have waiting periods for specific types of guns, but that leaves 40 states, 40 states with zero waiting periods on the books. Imagine if we enforced waiting periods federally. Imagine what that could do for the rate of gun violence. Because this is America, we have to talk about the Second Amendment. This is the bedrock that gun nuts cling to when they cry about their rights while insisting it includes the protected ownership of weapons of war. The Second Amendment states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, that may seem like a totally normal sentence since you probably heard it 10,000 times, but it could be the worst, most convoluted, comma-riddled trash sentence ever written, which I don't believe was on accident. You see, James Madison wrote this. He wrote our Constitution, and he was no dummy. He was a Princeton-educated founder with a specific education and interest in, among other things, political philosophy, rhetoric, and classical languages. So being charged by his colleagues to pen what would become arguably the most important document in the whole history of our nation wasn't a decision come too lightly. They chose him because they knew he was the best man for the job. They chose him because they knew, they knew that he knew what a goddamn comma was and how it was to be used. So again, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, another comma, shall not be infringed? This is a mockery of the written word. If the goal of language is to clearly communicate ideas, that completely misses the mark. Clearly, we're trying to understand whose right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But whose is the question? And this sentence doesn't clear it up at all. It only leaves us with more questions. The sentence starts with a well-regulated militia and finishes with the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Are the people being talked about the members of the militia? Or are the people random non-militia associated individuals? And if they are, then why didn't Madison begin the Second Amendment with the bit about the people and finish with the bit about the militia? Confusing, and again, I believe by design, to give future leaders the ability to tailor the Second Amendment to the needs of the nation. The other aspect to keep squarely in mind in this is that just like all advancements in technology and our understanding of the world, things have changed radically. 
When the Constitution was being drafted, it wouldn't be for over 100 years until we even discovered what a virus was. Similarly, since the Second Amendment was drafted in 1791, a lot has happened with regard to weapons technology. The Founding Fathers couldn't have predicted armor-piercing rounds, or rounds that travel at almost 5,000 feet per second, or any of the other myriad changes to guns that make them so much more deadly today. Back in the times of the drafting of the Second Amendment, the arms you'd bear consisted of black powder muskets that were one, wildly inaccurate, and two, laughably slow to reload. According to the Revolutionary War Journal, the average soldier was expected to release three volleys per minute. Four was exceptional. After the first volley, troops usually took from 20 to 30 seconds to reload. 20 to 30 seconds to reload. Thirty seconds. Imagine the lack of mass carnage that would exist if these cowardly dumb fucks were forced to pause for thirty seconds between shots. Compared to when the Second Amendment was penned, we now have weapons of war that can pump roughly seventy rounds into someone in that same thirty second period. In the same way we've evolved on other constitutional ideas, we must evolve the Second Amendment to the realities of our modern times. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see James Madison making a case for the Second Amendment saying, mass shootings are just something we have to live with because the right to bear arms and organize militias is just too precious. Sorry about all your dead loved ones, y'all. You should really think about getting a gun. So let's stop beating around the bush in this brief moment before the next brutal attack takes place. We need to talk about the actual elephants in the room. The ones who rush to defend gun rights like they're a cop justifying a lonely, horny neckbeard's desire to shoot up a spa. The Republicans. It's an astounding exercise in futility trying to understand what the GOP's ideology is anymore besides owning the libs. Fiscal responsibility and free market economics don't score many points with guys who believe Alex Jones when he says the one world government is turning the frogs gay, but beat that time honored drum of the nanny state is coming to ruin your fun and you just might be spared the next mob of slack jawed revolutionaries attempting a coup. That's why whenever tragedy turns public opinion towards a more progressive approach to guns, Canadian expat Rafael Eduardo Cruz will say something idiotic like this. And every time there's a shooting, we play this ridiculous theater where this committee gets together and proposes a bunch of laws that would do nothing to stop these murders. Oh, really, Ted? The Democrats are the ones engaging in ridiculous theater. That's funny because I was just thinking about how you're about two suspender stretches away from being typecast as a folksy country lawyer. Nice dramatic pause there, too. That's a pretty impressive rebrand for a guy whose roommate at Princeton said he used to skulk through the girl's dorm in a paisley bathrobe. Although, you may want to reconsider that mullet-beard combo that makes you look like Wolverine who was booted from the X-Men after eating too many cheeseburgers. Otherwise, you might risk the shred of Ivy League credibility you need to spew forth this kind of absolute bullshit with a straight face. Because Senator Grassley and I together introduced legislation, Grassley Cruz, targeted at violent criminals, targeted at felons, targeted at fugitives, targeted at those with serious mental disease, to stop them from getting firearms, to put them in prison when they try to illegally buy guns. What happens in this committee after every mass shooting is Democrats propose taking away guns from law-abiding citizens.
because that's their political objective. But what they propose, not only does it not reduce crime, it makes it worse. You want action, do you? But no amount of legislation will make any difference? Well, isn't that the Gordian knot of all legal explanations? Airtight logic, Senator. Guess you better mention all the shootings you've had to deal with in Texas, like that's some kind of defense of your position. Bring up the Second Amendment, push the power of prayer, and call it a day. Oh, Your Honor, I do indeed rest my case. Ted's not the only one who's got in front of the TV cameras to speak up on behalf of gun owners in the wake of recent shootings. Lindsey Graham said this on Fox News. I own an AR-15. If there's a natural disaster uh, in South Carolina where the cops can't protect my neighborhood, my house will be the last one that the gang will come to because I can defend myself. It is not surprising that Senator Graham imagines a natural disaster would inevitably lead to roving gangs all across the countryside. Personally, I hope I won't live long enough to see what happens when clean water becomes rare enough for people to kill each other over. But the idea of a guy like Lindsey Graham going head to head against bikers in bondage gear in some sort of Mad Max role play <laughs> is laughable at best. Lindsey Graham is the kind of guy who develops a taste for toilet bowl cleaner after having his head shoved in and flushed too many times. Hmm, minty. But all of this inane Republican talk serves a specific purpose. It's all about building a larger narrative that sells a uniquely American identity to any Steven Crowder-loving high school dropout with a Glock fetish that they could latch on to. The good guy with a gun. John McClain crawling around in an air duct of the Nakatomi building, or John Wayne taming the Wild West with nothing but a six-shooter. It's artificial masculinity wrapped up in misguided morality and forced down the throats of the public for the benefit of the only group who gets rich from this crisis, the gun lobby. In 2018, Forbes valued the entire firearms industry in the United States at $28 billion. And that year was only the fifth highest on record in terms of gun manufacturing. So much effort is put into blocking meaningful restrictions on gun ownership because so much is at stake for these companies. In the first half of 2016, the NRA spent $1.6 million just on preventing the enactment of stricter background checks. If that doesn't sound like a big chunk of blood money they're bringing in, remember that this is a long-term investment and the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence has a great memory. Their list of total contributions from the NRA to various senators over the course of their careers includes some pretty jaw-dropping numbers. Mitt Romney, $13.5 million. Cory Gardner, $4 million. Marco Rubio, three and a third million dollars. Joni Ernst, over three million dollars. Josh Hawley, who's just started, almost 1.5 million dollars. I guess it's a buyer's market for souls these days. Though, if you're a poor man Sarah Palin named Lauren Boebert, I bet you're wondering why you aren't getting a big girl check after shelling out for all that hardware. At least you get to look real tough on your Zoom calls, Congresswoman Boebert. But what is most stupefying of all is the total price of this horrifying violence. Not just in lives, but in actual dollars and cents. According to a 2019 report released by House Democrats on the Joint Economic Committee, gun violence costs the United States $229 billion annually. Ironically, these attacks are much more likely to happen in the South and the Midwest, parts of the country that are represented by many of the people on this list that I just mentioned. To put it plainly, owning an assault rifle is a privilege. It is not a right. And at this point, it's not a privilege anyone needs to have if fewer guns mean less gun violence. And less gun violence means fewer deaths in this country. That's what the studies show. That's what's borne out around the world. But we can't expect common sense gun control laws to succeed while an entire infrastructure exists to perpetuate bad faith arguments. 
I mean, it's pretty telling that as this 2009 University of Rhode Island report showed, some of the earliest gun control legislation to actually pass is based on the growing concern over black and immigrant gun ownership. To this day, the NRA barely makes a peep whenever a minority who is legally carrying a gun gets killed by police, as in the case of Philando Castile. And how about Jamel Roberson, the 26-year-old armed security guard who was shot to death by the cops outside an Illinois nightclub in 2018 while he was doing his job and subduing an actual active shooter? Anyone can see what's going on here. Guns are dangerous, and it's far too easy to buy the kinds that kill a lot of people very quickly. But with politicians in the gun lobby's pocket, we fail to pass laws that would make us safer. Every time we carve another notch of shame in our collective consciousness, these companies trot out their political puppets, yanking on their spines like marionette strings. These greedy fools offer their thoughts and their prayers while stoking the paranoid fantasy of the average Joe's responsibility to bring down a tyrannical government like some beer-gutted revolutionary. Get real. Your PT Cruiser won't stand a chance against a Predator drone no matter how many AR-15s you toss in the back. We need to take action by voting out politicians who are literally profiting off the deaths of their constituents and elect leaders who listen to experts and activists to craft policy that protects us, not the gun lobby. We've seen what works and have no excuse not to do better because as we've seen, when we do nothing, the cycle continues.